It's refreshing to think she won't be around for a while. My youngest brother was getting married, and I was busy preparing for an overnight stay. I even took paid time off to leave our home, where I live with my in-laws. It's been a while since I've done that. I was gathering my overnight bag to join the celebration. Then I heard my mother-in-law's voice chasing after me from behind. Never come back, and while you're at it, why don't you just get a divorce and leave? Sure, as you wish, I responded calmly and accepted her spite with a quiet smile. Leaving her sneering taunts behind, I stepped out of the house. Before I got too far, I said goodbye toward our home. Thank you for everything. It's been a long time. I don't recall ever being looked after by my mother-in-law, though somehow I feel very lighthearted. I pulled along a slightly oversized suitcase, rushing to the place where my beloved family awaited. I'll be staying at the hotel for two nights and three days. What comes after that remains a secret. My mother-in-law doesn't yet know the fact that I will never return as a resident of this house. I'm Margaret Johnson, a 48-year-old part-timer. While working at an office, I also manage our busy household. My husband Austin and I are the same age, and our marriage has lasted over 30 years. It was an arranged meeting recommended by an acquaintance, but we're a couple who share similar values and get along well. The only loneliness comes from Austin's job as a sailor. He works for a shipping company and can be away from home for over a year at times. Still, our relationship is good, and we are blessed with a son. We live in a house cohabiting with my in-laws. Until recently, I was primarily responsible for caring for my husband's grandmother, who lived with us. I used my income to hire a caregiver during the day. After that, I took care of her mostly by myself. This arrangement continued until my grandmother-in-law passed away. Margaret, thank you for everything over the years. Grandma must have been happy, too. She was grateful to you until the end. Austin's kind words brought tears to my eyes. Surrounded by children to great-grandchildren, my grandmother-in-law was well cared for. In her younger days, when I was young and unfamiliar with household tasks, it was she who taught me how to live properly from scratch. She was kind and fun, though strict at times. She seemed to be laughing most of the time. Being able to keep my job from my younger days and work part-time even during caregiving was all thanks to her. Despite the caregiving being a significant burden all along, now that it's over, I find myself nostalgically cherishing those days. I never imagined that the environment around me would change so drastically right after that. Austin, due to his job on the ship, often has to be away from home for long periods. I'm proud of him for his indispensable work in American logistics but living with my in-laws puts me at a disadvantage. The moment my grandmother-in-law passed away, my mother-in-law's attitude changed dramatically. Previously, she would try to appease me with sweet talk while dumping all the caregiving responsibilities on me. But as soon as the caregiving ended, she began to disregard me. When she went out, she would deliberately exclude me from the souvenirs, and when we passed each other in the house, she would bump into me on purpose. Her overly hostile behavior was so shocking that I couldn't help but be surprised before feeling disgusted. Moreover, my son Nolan, who happened to be visiting, said something to me. Hey, Grandma started saying nasty things again. It's an old story, but when Nolan was just four or five years old, there was a significant incident with my mother-in-law. She filled Nolan with baseless accusations against me and an upset Nolan reported this to the whole family. Your mom is cheating. She's going to leave you eventually. That woman is no good. She doesn't work, and she's all bad. Your dad hates her too. That's why he doesn't come home. You got that? I was shocked to learn she had been teaching him such lies. I wasn't cheating. And despite working every day and doing household chores, I was truly busy. Moreover. The reason Austin was absent was genuinely because of work. That's such a joke. It's ridiculous to take it seriously. Anyway, such a small kid won't understand anything. My mother-in-law sulked. 
and my father-in-law was also furious about it. I was too busy comforting a saddened Nolan to care about anything else. Later, when Austin came home, I remember feeling relieved as he changed his demeanor and scolded my mother-in-law. Now let's return to the present. Austin is currently away for work. Perhaps because of that, my mother-in-law seems to be taking full advantage. You'd think she'd have more free time now that the caregiving is over. But instead, she keeps me very busy. She frequently hands me complicated recipes to cook and takes this opportunity to demand a thorough cleaning. Just the other day, she invited the neighborhood ladies over, and they watched a marathon of dramas. I thought they were just enjoying themselves, but I ended up having to clean up the messy room full of snack wrappers and drink spills right during the busiest time before dinner. Adding unnecessary work, I was understandably irritated. Really, you're such a drag. Aren't you done yet? Hurry up and get dinner ready. She'd say this while I was sweating from cleaning up but come dinner time, she wouldn't even sit at the table claiming she was full from the snacks. I was utterly exasperated when Nolan then complained to me. She says she doesn't like you, that you should disappear. I'm going back home. I feel sick. Wouldn't it be better if we lived separately from Grandma? I think Dad would understand, too. I calmed down and upset Nolan and drove him to the station for his return trip. Of course, I couldn't let things continue like this. Soon, I'll need to have a serious talk with Austin. The day after Nolan left, I was troubled not by my mother-in-law, but by something else. Suddenly, I started feeling unwell. My limbs were cold, yet my face would suddenly heat up, and I'd break out in a sweat. It seems like today my symptoms of menopause were particularly severe. I've been feeling oddly unwell since last year, and the doctors told me it's menopause. Right now, they're just watching how it goes. No medication yet, but some days can be tough. Maybe the stress from what I heard about my mother-in-law's behavior is getting to me. By evening, my condition worsened, and I was lying down in my room. Hey, what are you sleeping for? Dinner. I could hear my mother-in-law stomping towards me. I had such a headache that it was hard to even get up, let alone deal with her. I thought about pretending to be asleep, but she suddenly yanked off the blanket and I reluctantly sat up. Dinner, she clapped her hands as she demanded it. If it's dinner she wants, she should just make it herself. Why does she always expect me to do it as if she's somebody special? Previously, my grandmother-in-law managed the kitchen, but lately it's only been me cooking. My mother-in-law only steps into the kitchen when Austin is home, and even then, she barely does more than arrange the plates. Maybe she can't cook at all. I'm feeling unwell. I think it's menopause, but I really can't do the housework today. Please, can you make dinner today? I managed to squeeze out those words while feeling utterly lethargic. My mother-in-law had severe menopause symptoms herself. I had already moved in with them and had my fair share of her snapping at me so there's no doubt about it. That's why I thought she'd understand the pain. If I mentioned it was menopause, however, her reaction was the exact opposite of what I had hoped for. With a snort, she suddenly turned a bag over above my head. What? I let out a small scream as something showered down in the dim room. Just waking from sleep and feeling sick, I couldn't tell what it was at first. A moment later, I realized it was the smell of potatoes. The bag she turned upside down was nearly empty of its snack contents, though I realized she had sprinkled me with snack crumbs. The sheer unexpectedness of it left me dumbfounded for a moment. Don't be lazy, she snapped, clicking her tongue as she left the room. Here I was, bedridden and in pain, being yelled at and nearly feeling like clicking my tongue back. How could she do something like this? Rather than anger, it was a bizarre sensation, like seeing some rare animal. I felt sure that my limit was nearing. About half a year later, I had taken some paid leave from work and was preparing for a trip. It was for my younger brother's wedding. He had been living with his girlfriend for a few years, 
and they were finally tying the knot. Their home is in New York, and they wanted to have the wedding there. Since it's quite far from here, I booked a hotel for a two-night, three-day stay. I decided to take the trip and participate overnight. My younger brother offered to cover the hotel costs, but I declined. Since the date of the ceremony was set according to my schedule, I wanted to pay for it myself. It's a small ceremony with just the family, but it's a rare opportunity for all the relatives to gather, so I'm looking forward to it. Since nobody else would likely prepare meals in my absence, I decided to make a week's worth of meals in advance. The night before leaving, while we were eating dinner, I told my in-laws about the meals I prepared and stored in the fridge. My father-in-law thanked me, but as usual my mother-in-law seemed displeased with everything about me. Making such a fuss about it, how presumptuous. Why are you even going to your brother's wedding? It's just a remarriage, isn't it? Probably nothing good. She frowned as she said this, and my father-in-law glared at her. Well, he's not someone who just stops at glaring. Actually, both my brother and his partner are marrying for the first time, I replied with a tilt of my head. My mother-in-law burst out laughing with a vulgar expression. What was so funny? It seemed she had misunderstood something. First marriage at 40? Must be something seriously wrong with him to be single that long. Your brother's at a good age, yet he's having a flashy wedding. Shameless. She seemed to be confusing him with another brother, or perhaps she had completely forgotten about my family's structure. In fact, I have three brothers. The youngest brother and I have a 14-year age gap, so he's still quite young. No, it's my youngest brother who's getting married. He's in his early 30s, and his partner is in her 20s. I shrugged and explained, but my mother-in-law raised her eyebrows as if offended by the correction. However, she soon twisted her face into a sneer again. How creepy. His partner is 20? That's like a parent and child. I was astonished at her refusal to listen. This time, even my father-in-law seemed to realize the mistake, clearing his throat. I swallowed a sigh as I responded, It's not 20. She's in her 20s. I've heard they are only four or five years apart. Doesn't that sound like a parent and child to you? I talked to her over video call the other day, and she seemed like a very sensible young lady. I ended the conversation with my in-laws and started preparing to leave. At the venue, I should see Nolan and my parents as well. I packed a beautiful outfit for the ceremony into my suitcase and meticulously checked for anything I might have forgotten. From the living room, I could hear my mother-in-law loudly talking to my father-in-law. It will be refreshing to have her gone for a while. I felt the malice in her words on my back as I bit my lip. Getting angry now could provoke her to tamper with my carefully packed belongings. Better to endure until I leave the house. The next morning I pulled my slightly large suitcase and headed to the front door. Never come back, and while you're at it, why don't you just get a divorce and leave? Her words momentarily stopped me. As I began walking towards the entrance again, I answered cheerfully, Yes, as you wish. My voice was calmer than I expected. Perhaps I'm more relieved by this situation than I realized. I had reached my limit of endurance long ago. Actually, I had been in touch with Austin beforehand, steadily preparing for this day. Just stop with the nonsense and really do it soon. My mother-in-law scoffed, munching on snacks and laughing early in the morning, seemingly unfazed by the future. It's just after waking up, and she can eat so much. It's surprising. I decided to walk to the station. As I left the house, before getting too far, I looked back at the familiar home and said with emotion, I really owe this house a lot. Except for my mother-in-law, I've been grateful to this home for a long time. To my grandmother-in-law, my father-in-law, Austin, and Nolan. I even feel indebted to the roof and the walls. But I can't recall ever needing my mother-in-law's help. Somehow I feel incredibly light-hearted. I hurried to the place where my beloved family was waiting 
pulling a slightly large suitcase behind me. I planned to stay at the hotel for two nights and three days. After that, I'm set to move into a new place where I can live alone. I met up with Austin at my brother's wedding venue. We had planned this beforehand. The reason the wedding was scheduled at this time was so Austin could be ashore and attend. Hard day, huh? Got this for you, Austin said with a lonely smile, pulling out a divorce paper. His name hadn't been filled in yet. We were both going to sign it, mutually agreeing it would be our final joint task as a couple. Thanks. Let's write it when we get back to the hotel. I booked a twin room. Hope that's okay. Though it's sad for my brother getting married today, this is also a new beginning for us. I hope it's okay that our signing the divorce papers happens on the same day as the wedding. I won't announce it in front of everyone today, but we'll have to make it known later that we've divorced. Of course. A double would have been fine, too. Thanks for booking. Austin and I smiled affectionately at each other. No one could possibly imagine that in a few hours, we would be signing a divorce paper. I marveled at how heavy a single piece of paper can feel. Filing this means we won't be husband and wife anymore after being together for over 30 years. Just one sheet is all it takes. I'm truly sorry, Austin apologized, but I shook my head. Being with Austin was always genuinely happy for me. I knew when I married him that he wouldn't be home much, and there was nothing I disliked about that. It was just his mother that I could never get along with. Don't apologize. You were a wonderful husband. Let's be good friends from now on. I expressed this with all the fondness I felt. Tearfully, Austin took my hand. Thank you for everything, Austin repeated, making me tear up as well. I secretly decided to attribute these tears to happiness for my brother's wedding. The next day, Austin went back to his parents' home alone. He explained the situation to his in-laws. At first, my father-in-law was just shocked by the sudden mention of divorce, but when he understood the full story, he became furious. How dare you drive out someone who cared for my mother until the end? He shouted angrily, causing my mother-in-law to visibly panic. While I was primarily involved in caring for my grandmother-in-law, including the physically demanding tasks like bathing, my father-in-law, who had been strong since his youth, helped me towards the end. He also took care of turning our bedridden grandmother in bed. In a way, my father-in-law and I were caregiving partners. However, my mother-in-law really hadn't helped with anything. It seems my father-in-law had been silently resentful about this. You've been terrible at housework ever since you married into the family. I kept quiet because you gave birth to our son, but you used my mother's leniency as an excuse to avoid helping out. You're nothing like Margaret, who did everything. His grievances escalated. My mother-in-law tried to retort when compared to me. But my father-in-law started speaking before she could get a word in. It should have been you who left. To think we lost a hard-working daughter-in-law like that. Do you have any idea how much luxury Margaret's salary provided us? You haven't earned a single penny. Mentioning money put my mother-in-law in a weak position. She had never worked outside the home. The household expenses, including what my in-laws used, were covered by Austin. Being a sailor, Austin earned a good salary, and my in-laws converted all their pension into pocket money. Honestly, our family was wealthy. The costs related to the children, or my grandmother-in-law's care, could actually be covered by Austin's earnings. Yet, I worked because working was fulfilling for myself. That's why I had no problem using my earnings for the family. I gave trips and theater tickets to my in-laws, and for birthdays, I would treat them to upscale dining. Truthfully, these gifts were also investments in securing some time for myself. It's not too late, Austin. Go apologize now and ask Margaret to marry you again, my father-in-law finally said. Realizing how precarious her position was, my mother-in-law was utterly distraught. But it was too late. She couldn't prevent the consequences of her actions from coming back to haunt her. This is the house I built. You leave! 
my father-in-law, finally enraged, began to drive my mother-in-law out. Understandably, she resisted vehemently, screaming and scratching at her disheveled hair in frustration. Just as she raised her voice in anger, she began clawing at her unkempt hair, repeating how frustrated she was. This sight was bizarre and apparently quite frightening. No, I won't leave. I won't divorce. How am I supposed to live alone at this age? In the end, she cried out in resistance, but she was no match for my physically imposing father-in-law who dragged her out of the house. Moreover, he firmly shut the door and even locked it. My mother-in-law clung to the front door, crying loudly enough that the neighbors, shocked by the commotion, called the police. Reluctantly, my father-in-law opened the door when approached by the police, but his anger did not subside for several days afterward. My mother-in-law and father-in-law lived as if they were separated within the same house. They didn't speak a word to each other. They avoided even looking at each other. In fact, whenever my father-in-law entered the same room, my mother-in-law would flee in fear. Such a life couldn't continue, and ultimately, my father-in-law even called his daughter, who lived far away, to hold a family meeting. I'm going to divorce her, he declared. But his daughter showed sympathy for my mother-in-law and opposed the idea, making the discussion difficult. Austin then detailed the situation, confirming each instance of harassment I had endured. She had even lied to our son, trying to turn him against me, his mother. Austin presented emails he had asked our son to write, recalling those times as evidence. He also spoke about the suffering I endured during my menopause. To this point, my father-in-law, who had witnessed it, expressed his disapproval. I hadn't known, but he had told my mother-in-law to stop such behavior afterward. He had advised her to apologize, but she had not followed through. And now this incident. She had unfairly criticized my brother and mockingly told me to divorce and leave. All this happened while Austin was away, and she acted differently in front of him. Austin added that I had managed all the household chores and that I, along with the caregiver, had completed caring for my grandmother-in-law. In that situation, how would you feel if your husband's mother did the same to you? And if your father-in-law got angry on your behalf, whose side would you take? When Austin posed this question, his sister fell silent. Seeing this, my mother-in-law became furiously upset. Are you betraying me too? After all I did by giving birth to you. Hearing her, I ironically admired her honesty. She didn't claim to have raised them. I had always asked Austin about this. It was mostly our grandmother who took care of my sister and me. Mom was always out with neighbors. Perhaps remembering her past, his sister looked at my mother-in-law with contempt after hearing about the bullying. In the end, the only working housewives in this house were my grandmother-in-law, whom I cared for until the end, and myself. My mother-in-law was indeed the mother who had given birth to two children. However, when it came to housework, she mostly just wanted to reap the benefits without doing much work. By reflecting on this, her habitual negligence was finally noticed by the family, completely undermining her position. Realizing her situation, my mother-in-law stopped her tirades and began to sob. In the end, it was decided not to divorce out of pity, but my father-in-law was considering separating from her. Upon hearing this, I expressed my desire to meet with my father-in-law. All these events after my departure were relayed to me by Austin. If Dad was going to get so angry now, he should have helped Margaret from the start. But then again, what can I say when I wasn't there? Austin sighed despondently, sipping his hot coffee. We were in our favorite cafe, a place we had liked since our younger days. Austin ordered a coffee, and I chose a soft drink, which I hadn't had in a very long time. As I finished hearing about my mother-in-law's disgraceful behavior, I smiled softly. Don't be too hard on yourself. You were away because of your job, right? It's an important job. There are many people who rely on you. My words of encouragement weren't false. Austin's job is admirable. Being a sailor, 
supporting people's lives by working in maritime shipping, sometimes away for years at a time. I think that's incredible. That's why I've been putting up with it. But I'm sorry for this time. I still like and respect you, but I just couldn't bear being family with your parents anymore. I finally managed to say the words that had been stuck in my chest for so long. Austin looked a bit sad, but nodded in understanding. He didn't blindly side with his parents just because they were his family. He understood the situation fairly, which made me incredibly happy. I couldn't help but smile broadly, and Austin looked at me as if dazzled. I only heard about what Austin was feeling at that moment much later. He said he thought, Oh, she's beautiful. Your smile was more radiant than ever before to me at that moment. Austin also seemed sweeter than ever before. Now, back to the story. The day after I met Austin at the cafe, I met with his father with Austin's cooperation. It was time for the final act of my revenge. When Austin's father arrived at the cafe, he was dressed a bit more stylishly than usual since he was going out. After some small talk about the weather, I quickly brought up the main topic. I heard from Austin that you're considering separating from your wife. It's fine while you're still healthy, but it'll be tough on your own later, right? Especially after all the commotion. If you really do decide to separate, I'm willing to help with caring for you in your later years. His father clearly looked pleased by this. Austin's sister lived far away, and his son Austin could be away for long periods at sea. He had never been one to do much around the house, like cooking, cleaning, or laundry. He would surely appreciate my help, having taken care of his mother until the end. Of course, I'll separate from her. No, wait, maybe it's better to divorce, he said, furrowing his brow and crossing his arms. I was hoping that my almost certainly ousted mother-in-law would go from almost to definitely ousted, but it seemed the situation was developing even more unfavorably for her. However, it seems that the situation is becoming increasingly unfavorable for my mother-in-law. If I suddenly dropped dead, she'd probably make a big fuss, wouldn't she? Better to divorce her properly before that. That's definitely better. Austin looked as if he wanted to say, Here we go again. As his father began speaking more decisively, his father has a tendency to act swiftly once he's made up his mind. Sometimes he even goes a bit too far, but that's just his nature. Knowing this, I nodded in agreement with a grin. You really do think things through. I'm impressed by your foresight, I said, knowing how to handle him after living with him for so many years. Pushing him a little like this would likely lead him to actually do it. Austin chuckled sensing my intentions, but chose not to stop me. Probably, he felt more angered by my mother-in-law's behavior than I was. His father, energized, stood up to go get the divorce papers right then. Out of kindness, I decided to introduce the lawyer Austin, and I consulted for our divorce to help my father-in-law. From that day on, my father-in-law began actively pursuing the divorce. It was clear that my mother-in-law was destined for a lonely life. A week later, I returned to what was once my familiar home, now just my former in-law's house. I went to collect the belongings I hadn't been able to take with me before. I had taken all the valuables, but it was impossible to take everything. Clothes, books, photos filled with memories, drawings by my son when he was little, and bedding and furniture I bought with my own salary. Over the years, I had accumulated many personal items in that house. This visit turned out to be the last time I would see my mother-in-law. By then, her divorce had been decided, and she was visibly panicking. As I went to collect my belongings, she began to kneel before me, her face pale as she started apologizing. Margaret, please forgive me. I beg you. It was all just a joke please come back and convince your husband. I completely ignored her and continued packing. After continued groveling, my mother-in-law stood up abruptly. It seemed she was upset at being ignored. 
she began to hurl vile insults at me again, reverting to her old ways. This woman, how dare you when I'm being so humble? You've been nothing but trouble since you married into this family. Just leave and die alone miserably. After a string of similar yet unrepeatable insults, she spat as she shouted those words at me. Still, I continued to ignore her and packed the items into a cardboard box. Suddenly, she screamed and lunged at the box. Taken aback, I dodged, and she ended up overturning the box that contained neatly folded clothes. The neatly folded clothes were scattered all over the floor. She then began stomping on and kicking the clothes, throwing a tantrum. Enough already, Austin shouted, glaring at her. His mother, usually hearing only compliance from her obedient son, froze as if it were the end of the world. I held back Austin with one hand and turned an emotionless face towards my mother-in-law. I am no longer your daughter-in-law. You are no longer my mother-in-law. Our relationship is completely severed. Thank you for nothing. I was helped by your mother and father-in-law, your husband. I swiftly stepped around the scattered clothes. Without bothering to fold them again, I just stuffed them into the box and lifted it up. Don't touch my things, stranger. Goodbye. I tossed those final words at the disheveled mother-in-law and quickly left the room. I had no desire to share space with that woman any longer. I called Austin to take care of the rest of the belongings. I got into the car, driven by my brother, and waited as he prepared to leave. I could still hear my mother-in-law shrieking from inside the house. But listening to her was a waste of time. After we left, I heard she continued to beat her own head and wailed terribly. As far as I was concerned, there was never a chance for reconciliation. But it seemed she deeply regretted cutting off her last hope. But her regrets were too late to matter to anyone. About a month later, my mother-in-law was finally evicted from the house and began living alone in a modest place. Austin occasionally visits his mother to check on her well-being, as does his sister. I've heard that my mother-in-law now lives in her old clothes, substituting them for pajamas, and doesn't even bother to take a shower regularly. Apart from shopping, she hardly goes outside spending her days eating fast food and budget snacks while lamenting her impoverished life. Apparently, she did split some assets with my father-in-law during the divorce, but sadly, it wasn't a significant amount, and she's living with financial insecurity in her old age. I don't know about my sister, but I'm not giving her any support. That's obvious, right? Austin told me this with a shrug. As a well-paid sailor, Austin was always a source of pride for his mother. She never expected to be completely cut off by her own son. All this was because she constantly disregarded me, the wife her son chose. And yet, the irony is that she herself had said, never come back, just get a divorce and leave. Now she's the one who can't ever come back. It's exactly like the saying, curses return upon the heads of those that curse. She should have been prepared to face her own misfortunes if she wished ill on others. Five years after the divorce, I'm enjoying a peaceful life alone with my cat in an apartment about a 30-minute drive from what used to be my in-law's home. I settled here after looking for a place convenient for commuting to work. The rental is pet-friendly and even welcomes them. It's a lovely place with good sunlight. I still visit my former father-in-law's home once a week, cooking him various dishes. Our relationship has seemingly improved since the divorce. My sister-in-law, living far away, can hardly look me in the eye given how much I still help out. Austin and I still keep in touch. In fact, when he returns from his long sea voyages, we make sure to go on dates. It's almost like courting each other anew. We go to movies, visit museums, and despite being somewhat new at this, our relationship feels fresh and exciting. We spend hours on the phone and exchange messages, finding this surprisingly enjoyable. Nolan, who visits us on his days off, jokes about our fake divorce, saying, You two just went back to being lovers, didn't you? But the truth is, 
Austin and I never were lovers before. Our marriage was arranged, and we never really had a period of romance. So now it's like I'm building a romantic relationship with him for the first time. We even have a secret pact. If we ever find ourselves completely free from having to deal with his mother, whether she passes away, moves in with his sister, or goes into a facility, then we'll remarry. Austin suggests that this would be when no more welfare checks on his mother are necessary. Discussions about whether his sister and her husband will start living with her or place her in a facility have already begun. Our reunion might not be so far off after all. After more than 30 years together and now nearing our 50s, it feels somewhat embarrassing to talk about this. But I'm thrilled at the prospect of experiencing a first true love with Austin, whom I've always cared for deeply.